see that many of our participants are joining and continuing to join. So hello everyone and welcome. Um, my name is Olive Moore. I am the Deputy Director of Frontline Defenders and um, we are delighted to be here today to be hosting this webinar, Supporting Women Human Rights in Iran, um, What Role for the European Union? And of course to be co-hosting with two MEPs, with MEP Ernest Ortizan and MEP Cornelia Ernst. So um, we'd really like to welcome you all. Um, and maybe just a couple of words first, just on logistics to follow through. So there will be some of the, some of the discussions here will be through Farsi. Um, when that is the case, we do have interpretation from Farsi to English. So for now, when those, when our, when some of our participants are speaking in Farsi, if you look at the bottom of your screen on the right hand side, there should be a globe which says interpretation. And when you click on that and you click on English, we should have English English interpretation for you. Um, there are some, if you look in the chat there, there's some more details in relation to that. Um, we did want to note that this event is going to be recorded. And we're recorded. And then we'll also hear from our participants and then open up for questions and a conversation session at the end. So for anyone who is um, has any questions or has any thoughts, by all means, please post them into the chat as you go along there. Um, so maybe just to some opening remarks, um, one of the things certainly within Frontline Defenders that we've seen over the last year is that all of us know it's been a very difficult year for many of us, but it has been a particularly difficult year for human rights defenders. Um, in the last year, um, one of the roles that we do within Frontline Defenders is track the situation for human rights defenders, including women human rights defenders around the world. And what we've seen last year quite, um, quite horrendously is that 331 human rights defenders were murdered last year for their work, um, many of those in the Americas and in Colombia, but also globally around the world in other countries. Um, we've also seen the trends that we've previously seen around harassment, around detention, around criminalization, and um, experience in torture, mistreatment, defamation, all of those things have continued and in many cases have increased. And of course, within the last year, COVID has exacerbated many of these trends where we've seen governments and other forces using the opportunity of COVID to further target human rights defenders for their work. Um, we know the situation in Iran hasn't been different for this. Um, from, we've seen the situation, the human rights situation in Iran deteriorate for a number of years now, and particularly the situation for women human rights defenders there. Women human rights defenders in Iran experience criminalization, experience lengthy prison sentences, physical attack, defamation, and much more. We may hear a little bit of that here today. Um, and particularly, again, COVID-19 exacerbated this. Um, one of the very vulnerable groups that we've seen throughout globally in the world today in relation to COVID has been prisoner HRDs. And the situation for prisoner HRDs in countries around the world, and particularly in Iran, has been very difficult in that prisoners have been denied, denied the access um, for any kind of release. Um, releases that were being offered have been denied opportunities to medical care and many other cases and this is something we may hear a little bit more about and I suppose really just to say in the whole area of supporting women human rights defenders one of the most important parts of this is dialogue is conversation and following that conversation up with action and the reason that this particular seminar is important here today is that we have a number of actors joining us um, our colleagues from the European Parliament who've been very active in this way and um, experts on the EU Iran relations national governments and all of those actors play an extremely important role in standing up and speaking out and working together with human rights defenders from particularly our women human rights defenders from Iran that we'll hear from today. So we very much welcome this space to have a conversation and a dialogue and to look at well, what are the opportunities for action and how can we work collaboratively together on that. And I suppose in particular, we very much welcome our co-hosts um, to our two MEPs. Um, we've seen how the European Parliament has been a long-term champion of women human rights in Iran. We've seen how the Sakharov Prize being awarded to Nazarin in 2012. And then of course, there's been several human rights resolutions and other opportunities coming up. So I suppose at this stage, I'm going to very much welcome our colleague MEP, MEP Ortizan, and also MEP Cornelia Erst. And Cornelia, if you want to turn on your camera and join us, that would be great. And I'm gonna hand over now to our colleague, MEP Ortizan to say a couple of words of welcome. So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon and, and welcome everyone. Uh, it is my big pleasure to go host this timely event with my colleague uh, Cornelia Ernst uh, in partnership with you, with Frontline Defenders, uh, uh, that you do an excellent job all around the world. And I'm, I'm really, really 
uh, proud uh, to, to be able to to have this activity today with you on uh, on Iran, and particularly as we approach International Women's Day. Um, as the discussions around Iran are currently dominated by the future of the nuclear deal, uh, to which the EU remains committed and ready to build bridges of understanding between the parties, we feel there is also a need, and that's why we're organizing this and we are speaking out loud our voices in the parliament to turn some at attention to the human rights situation outside the country and the closing space for human rights defenders being uh, more acute in the case of women. Uh, women are routinely arrested, imprisoned and harassed for peacefully exercising their rights of freedom of expression and assembly in defense of gender equality in Iran. We are very well aware of that. The European Parliament, as you were mentioning, uh, has been a long-term champion for uh, women rights defenders in Iran, having awarded its Sahara Prize to Nazrin in, in 2012, as you mentioned before, and adopting also several human rights uh, urgency resolutions in the past uh, years, focusing on women, uh, on human rights defenders specifically. However, these resolutions we all know that, are not enough to address this injustice. They help. But we want today's event also to serve as an awareness-raising platform uh, to discuss uh, what more can we do to defend human rights in Iran and those of women in particular. And I would like to tell you that we as MEPs are uh, particularly today here with the spirit of learning a lot from you uh, and, uh, be, uh, and raise more awareness about what's the situation of women in Iran and also... Uh, in order to uh, amplify your voices uh, in Brussels and in the parliament so we can uh, uh, continue fighting uh, together. So for that, I know that uh, uh, we uh, have an exceptional panel uh, with us today to discuss the situation on the ground with whom, wh human, uh, women human rights defenders from uh, Iran and experts. But, and this is also important, we will also hear from high level officials from Germany and the, uh, and the European Union regarding the actions being taken by the international community to support women's rights in Iran, which I think is going to be a fruitful dialogue. I would like to thank again all the speakers for having accepted our invitation uh, and again uh, uh, to frontline defenders for their support and collaboration. Um, and then maybe now just give the floor to my colleague Cornelia Ernst. As you know, she's the chairwoman of the delegation for relations with Iran, uh, and I'm understanding Robert. For, for Iran in the uh, uh, Foreign Affairs Committee of the European Parliament. And we are uh, uh, a lot working hand in hand in issues related to the country, uh, in issues related to human rights uh, and women's rights. Uh, and that is why it's uh, also a pleasure for me to organize this event again with her. So thank you so much again. Thank you, Mr. Urtizan. And while, while Mr. Ernst is um, putting on her camera, I suppose it would mention, as you mentioned yourself there, of course, you've been a member of the European Parliament since 2014, sitting on the, the um, European Parliament Standing um, Rapporteur in Iran, and then also, of course, the Women's Right and Gender Equality Commission. And we certainly hear that in your comments, so it's very great. We very much welcome your role here. And of course, Ms. Ernst, also a member of the European Parliament for a number of years, since 2009, um, Chairperson of the European Parliament Delegation for Relations for Iran, and a member of the Committee on Civil Liberties and Justice and Home Affairs. So we also very much welcome yourself joining, and I suppose the expertise and the role that you bring to this as well. So please, over to you. Wow, you can speak so quickly. <laughs> oh, you should stop me. Sometimes no, no, I speak no, no, too no, fast. No, no, no. no, no, no. <laughs> First of all, I, I have forget. to thank Ernesto, um, Ernest uh, for his um, initiative. It's an honor for me to speak uh, with you and to talk with you about this issue. And uh, I remember when we were with the Iran delegation in Tehran in 2013. We met the human rights uh, activist Nasrin Sotoudeh. It was, for me, it was a highlight, really. A small, petite woman with uh, strong political demands to do more than before to put the rights issues in Iran in the middle of our debates in Europe. And in the following year, years, we met women rights uh, activists in uh, different places who protested against headscarf and um, or, Personally, personally felt uh, that women um, also got to a uh, football stadium, uh, women uh, as artists and uh, in, in a lot of other uh, professions. There is undoubtedly no other group of the population, uh, if you look uh, at the population in Iran, that is so fundamentally marginalized. In addition, this is a hard and harmful image of women and families that is based on Sharia uh, law. This is the one side of the Iranian women's life, uh, and we have to talk about that. But there is, in my view, another side, another side 
uh, effect that is this, precisely this group of um, um, people in Iran that has the greatest and the most hopeful potential for changes in Iran. This is my, uh, my feeling. 60% of the university graduates are women. Uh, some of them are much better educated than so many, many men. And um, <laughs> many are very well networked uh, in structures, uh, instructors, but also externally. And this is very difficult. Iran is a closed uh, society, and so sorry, I come from a closed society, a former closed society in East Germany. I know what does it mean. And yet there are protests and courageous uh, women. I want to be very clear, without Iranian women, there will be no change in Iran. Or in other words, the depth of changes to come in Iran, and there will be changes depends on the strength of women more than any other groups in the uh, population in Iran. This is, that's a change, uh, that's a chance uh, for, for Iranian society, and I'm pleased that we can uh, discuss uh, today about all these issues, uh, wonderful experts. I am really interested to hear a lot and uh, to use it for our work uh, in the European Parliament. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Ernst. And I think many of us here share your enthusiasm and admiration for women in Iran, women human rights defenders, and absolutely agree on that transformative and potential for change that we see and that we've seen many of the women human rights defenders have shown. So I suppose on that, we're now going to hear from two women human rights defenders from Iran. And we're very happy to be joined here today by Nargis Mohammadi and also Farzana Jalali. Um, so firstly, um, Nargis. So Nargis is the spokesperson for the Defenders of the Human, of the Defenders of Human Rights Center. She's also the president of the Executive Committee of the National Council of Peace in Iran. And she was awarded the Per Einger Prize by the Swedish government for her human rights work in 2011. Um, in 2016, Nargis was sentenced to 10 years in prison for forming and managing an illegal group, among other charges. Um, at the time, UN human rights experts were very vocal and repeatedly calling for her release. And most recently in July 2022, um, after she fell ill with COVID-19, which, which she was subjected to while in prison, um, she was eventually released. And this was because of a law that was introduced at the time around, around political prisoners and around releases for political prisoners. Um, she's currently under a travel ban and can't leave. And Nargis can't go to see her own children who are in Paris and hasn't seen them in many, many years. And of course, very unfortunately, last Saturday, she was summoned and refused to appear in court on a new charge, um, which was of disturbing prison order, which was filed against her because she made a complaint around sexual harassment for when she was in detention. Um, we're very happy that Nargis has been able to join us here today. Um, so she is on the call and will be joining us later in the questions and answers session. But actually, because we weren't sure because of the security situation, we weren't sure now whether Nargis would be joining us. So we'd actually pre-recorded a video with her. So we're actually going to play that video now, and then Nargis will join us in the end for the question and answer session. Okay, I think we're having a bit of a challenge with the sound. Mm -hmm. So if you bear with us, we'll get this working again. Thanks. And solitary confinement, we need okay. public institutions. Iranian government goes. This is all the usual technical challenges that we have. So just bear with us for a minute or two and we'll play again. Situation. 
and consider the right of organization and association and assembly, which is people's basic right in the Constitution, and also an important article in Declaration of Human Rights as the most necessary requirement in Iran society, both of which are neglected by Iranian government. The execution situation is alarming. Execution of children, political activists, and others have increased. There are still women sentenced to be stoned, whose sentence has turned into execution. In Zanjan prison, I witnessed that an imprisoned woman sentenced to be stoned turned into execution sentence, suffered eight years of imprisonment. Poverty and starvation have seriously increased and Iranian middle class is collapsing. The annihilation of middle class is a serious concern and the damage for seekers of democracy and freedom. Social crises such as drug um, addiction and women's prostitution for survival um, are some of the um, serious concern. Universities in Iran are not independent and the government has uh, dominated them entirely. Academic courses, professors, and even teaching methods are under the government control, and the students are intensely under pressure and suppressed by the government, suffering imprisonment through court trial. Coronavirus pandemic has added to poverty and psychological pressure and prevents civil and political activists to work effectively. Universities are closed down and any gathering is impossible. This is to government's advantage and the society's determined. Generally, the situation of women in Iran society has been one of our concerns. Discriminating laws against women set in Islamic Republic of Iran has been a means to suppress women. These laws have brought advantages for men and intolerable restrictions for women. On the one hand, Iranian government is a religious one According to what religious clergy states, a uh, woman is a second hand gender and she does not have the same human rights as man. Uh, on the other hand, the rule of law in Iran is extracted from um, jurisprudence, which uh, has strongly been against women. And does not recognize her rights. Islamic Republic of Iran considered human rights activities as a threat against itself and strongly suppressed them. Human rights activists are faced with the, uh, imprisonment sentences, frequent detentions, and dreadful surveillance and control. When uh, the two warding situations begin being a woman and a human rights activist in Iran are combined, and you will witness the tolerable uh, vulnerability of uh, female human rights uh, activists. This means that I am threatened by the government because I am a human rights activist. And as a woman, I encounter legal, traditional, and religious restrictions. Nevertheless, uh, women have proven through the life of Islamic Republic of Iran that they stand their grand, their grand to achieve what they require by perseverance, struggle, and resistance, and they have already achieved a few. 
Women's activities in public struggle to reach freedom and justice has been significant and effective. Their perseverance for public awareness, organizing peaceful and nonviolent civic activities has been a model due to the pressure applied by community of women, men in authority have frequently had to withdraw. It is a long way ahead of us to obtain equality between men and women. However, I am very hopeful and confident of the power of women and the future ahead. Government of the Islamic Republic of Iran has faced public resistance who wanted to achieve justice and freedom, and this government is under pressure. This public resistance should join with the pressure of international communities in order to limit the power of suppressions in the country and to control the government's overseas interferences uh, in the Middle East. Therefore, human rights defenders and peace seekers, especially active women in such area, should struggle against human rights violation and government's violent politics. Where with all their uh, strengths, international society should act more responsibly and pay attention to democracy, human rights, and realization peace. Uh, beside the uh, interests and goals of Western countries. In this regard, international society should also consider guarantee of human rights with, by Islamic Republic of Iran in the nuclear ne negotiations. So thank you very much, Nargis, for taking the time um, to, in advance, to share your thoughts and um, your experience, your analysis and your thoughts and some of the challenges and some of the things that need to be done. Um, and it'll be great to have you join us in our Q&A session when we get to the end here. Um, so the second woman human rights defender that we're going to hear from today is Farzana Jalali. Um, so Farzana is one of the active figures in the recent Me Too movement in Iran. She writes and works for feminist NGOs and websites inside Iran. Um, she was persecuted inside Iran for her activism and subsequently left Turkey, but has also been judicially targeted in Turkey for her activi activities there by the Turkish government. So Farzana, I'm going to invite you to turn on your camera. Um, Farzana will be speaking in Farsi. So for those of you or those of us who require interpretation, if you look to the bottom of your screen, there should be an interpretation globe there. Um, and if you click on English there, the interpretation will be provided there. So welcome, Farzana. Salam. Uh, Greetings to you. Thank you very much for the organizers of this webinar and for having given me the opportunity to speak with you all. I'm going to speak about the achievements and challenges of the Iranian women's movement. I will just say a few words because I don't have much time to speak in depth. The Iranian women struggle against gender-based injustices and inequalities has had a turbulent history. Um, from the early days of the Islamic Revolution, women have been at the forefront of the struggle and resistance against the policies of the regime. Despite the wave of repression of women activists that has continued since the Islamic Republic came to power, the women's movement has done its utmost to seize even the smallest of opportunities to change such legislation and achieve equal rights. Calls for accession to the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, the one million signature campaign to change discriminatory laws against women, the Stop Stoning campaign with focus on abol abolishment of the stoning law are only a few of the activities of the women's movement during 40 years of religious and patriarchal rule. 
rule. Determining the restrictions and the law on female body as continued un unabated laws as such as compulsory hijab, reducing the minimum age of marriage for girls to 13 and to even nine if it's per been permitted by the court. And also having halving women's uh, blood money or dear compared to that of the man and deeming divorce as the exclusive right of the husband. These are some of these uh, laws. One here I would like to mention two contemporary movements regarding women's demands. First is the movement against the compulsory wearing of the hijab. Iranian women's resistance and revolt against the obligatory hijab is nothing new from the women's struggle during the constitutional movement of the early 20th century to the 8th March 1979 and the uprising of what is known as the Girls of the Engelab Street. On 27 December 2017, a young girl named V. Damova had spontaneously jumped on a utility box on Engelab Street in Tehran, tied her scarf to a stick in protest in a silent plea for freedom. The next day in the city of Mashhad, people took to the street to protest against their living conditions. And uh, soon other women joined the Engelab Street girl protest by removing their hijab, while uprisings were staged in other Iranian cities to protest the deplorable living conditions. Sabah Kordafshari, one of the young protesters against forced hijab, has been sentenced to 15 years in prison on charges of promoting corruption and prostitution by removing the hijab in public. Uh, Saba is in prison alongside her mother. Nasrin Sotude, a prominent lawyer, has been sentenced to 33 years in prison on charges of promoting corruption and prostitution through defending and supporting the Engelab Street. Many forced hijab protesters have been arrested convicted and forced to leave the country. Second is the Me Too movement. The wave of sexual harassment and uh, revelations on social media has been a turning point in giving voice to women in Iran who are rarely heard otherwise. Many people have publicized stories of sexual harassment on uh, through social media accounts, in particular feminist social media. Uh, once posted, as we all know, such stories can no longer be ignored. Now, a number of acclaimed artists, well-known journalists, researchers, political activists, and even human rights activists have been persecuted. They've been harassed and even raped for joining this wave. Article 637 of the Islamic Penal Code criminalizes sex outside marriage as a crime against chastity. This legal article has prevented many women from going to court because they cannot easily prove that the rape was committed, the act of sex, in fact, was committed without their consent. The taboo of sex education for children, the lack of support from legislatures, the vague and complex definitions of crime in law, the traditions of a part uh, our patriarchal society and social norms and the lack of civil society in Iran have provided the basis for sexual aggression. That is why it is down to international organizations and governments within who, which especially governments that have an increasing role in Iranian policy making to ensure the voices of women are heard owing to the absence of civil institutions. Iran should introduce a new law that explicitly criminalizes rape and sexual harassment and provides protection for the victim's mental and physical health. A policy of punishment based on severe repression without forcing perpetrators to pay compensation and without provision of social protection to victims can be neither effective nor in keeping with administration of justice. Sex education is not part of the curriculum of the Iranian educational system and it has been provided for the first time in universities in a limited fashion. Almost three years ago, the supreme leader of the Islamic Republic ordered the officials of the Iranian educational system to reject UNESCO's 2030 document on sustainable development goals. This document, as you know, calls on countries to include sex education in their school curricula. But the supreme leader believes that Iran has upstream documents in the field of education and does not need the UNESCO document. 
I'm, I'm going to end my presentation at this point, but I will be happy to answer your questions in the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you, Frizara, Friz, Farzana, and thank you also to Nargis. I think um, your call out there for women's voices and the voices of women human rights defenders to be heard and to be listened to is loud and clear. Um, and from, from hearing from you both, it's clear that the narration, the explanation, the analysis of what's happening inside Iran for women human rights defenders best comes from women like yourselves from inside Iran and also have the best solutions. And of course, he called out for international organizations, which includes international NGOs like ourselves and also our colleagues at Human Rights Watch. So um, I'm now actually going to call on Tara Sapiri Farr. Um, Tara is a researcher in the Middle East and North African division at Human Rights Watch um, with a focus on um, Iran and Kuwait. And prior to joining Human Rights Watch, she was the deputy director of human rights in the Iran unit in the Sisi University of New York. Um, and also a native Farsi speaker, though I believe um, we'll be speaking in English now, so not, not a need for translation at the moment. So Tara, please, um, over to you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak about this, uh, this important issue on this panel. And it's such a pleasure and privilege to be speaking alongside of uh, some of the most prominent uh, women's human rights defenders in Iran. It's, it's such a pleasure to see uh, now, I guess, being outside prison and being able to um, raise her voice as she, she always has over the past decades. Um, both Nargis and Farzan spoke about many challenges Iranian uh, Iranian women human rights defenders face in Iran, uh, face in Iran, and the resilience of the Iranian women's rights movement to push back against repression and constantly coming up with new ways to challenge um, challenge the persistent discrimination. Um, I would like to uh, put the struggle of women human rights defenders in the broader context of the situation of human rights in Iran. Um, over the years, we have seen a consistent um, targeting of activists and peaceful dissidents by various intelligence bodies, including Ministry of Intelligence and IRGC intelligence organization. Um, over the years, intelligence authorities in close collaboration with judicial authorities use um, vaguely defined national security charges um, against activists and sentence them to unfair um, prison sentences and trials that fall grossly of international fair trial standards. Um, just to mention a few of the most important ones, um, access to legal defense is, is highly restricted in the Iranian system. Judges often act um, as prosecutors and interrogators and not impartial arbitrary of justice um, and allegations of um, torture and mistreatment in detention are rarely uh, even taken note. Um, over the past um, years, we've past few years, we've seen um, authorities using increasingly harsh charges against peaceful activists. Perhaps I can elaborate with a few examples to understand the severity of the situation. Um, women's rights defenders who opposed um, compulsory hijab laws in Iran and, and took off their headscarf in protest um, have been hit by um, the charge of um, uh, promoting moral corruption on earth, can, uh, moral corruption that carried 10 years in prison um, instead of the simple punishment of not wearing a headscarf that would carry much less prison sentence. Or in another case, authorities have been increasingly using their charge collaboration with a hostile state against dual and foreign nationals in Iran, as well as activists for any perceived or real connection, regardless of the degree of separation with, with the US government and US entities. Um, targeting of um, human rights defenders and activists does not end with sentencing and imprisonment. Um, the rights of activists are regularly violated while they're serving prison sentences. Um, their access to um, family visits, contacts with their family members, access to medical, uh, medical care um, are restricted. And even after they serve their prison sentences and are released, continue to face restriction. The case of um, Nargis is a very good example of, um, of how the targeting um, goes way well beyond just imprisonment. 
formal association and even members of formal political um, political parties and organizations also operate in a very limited space. Just yesterday, the court ruled to dissolve one of the most prominent NGOs on the ground, Imam Ali's popular student relief society that works on poverty, eradication, and other crucial important issues faced by marginalized communities such as child marriage and death penalty against those who've committed um, crimes as children. But one of the most important and concerning patterns we've observed is the persistence of a persistence of impunity for various violations, various serious human rights violations, and increasingly limited um, domestic avenues for seeking justice. Almost a year and a half after the brutal crackdown against nationwide protests that sparked after a abrupt um, increase in fuel prices in November 2019, where according to numerous accounts, authorities used excessive and lethal force against protesters, authorities have not announced the total number of people who were killed and injured and have not held anyone accountable. Instead of investigating those serious violations, authorities have proceeded with issuing scores of unfair sentences against protesters, including a number of death sentences in connection to those protests. Um, we've seen alarming cases of the use of death penalty as a political tool. Um, perhaps the most notable case is the case of Ruhol Dazdam, an Iranian uh, journalist who reside, uh, resided in France and was lured into Iran and, and executed. Um, in connection to his activities um, um, of having a um, telegram channel um, telegram channel. Um, the, I can go on and on explaining about um, the deterioration of the situation, but what's clear is that despite the clear deterioration of the situation in many um, aspects of civil and political rights, um, over the past few years, the maximum pressure policy launched by the administration in the US um, made multilateral approach um, to addressing these very serious situation more difficult. Um, um, the space to um, talk about these issues and take actions beyond rhetoric was extremely limited. And it's also important to mention that the bro broad sectoral sanctions unleashed by um, the previous administration in the US negatively impacted the livelihood of millions of Iranians and caused harm in their access to health. At the time that the country is still combating with combating COVID-19, limited access to humanitarian funds only add to the great harm already caused by authorities and terrible mismanagement of the crisis. Um, these sanctions, as well as um, restrictions on travel and banking, are leaving Iranian, uh, Iranian civil society, those who are, who, whom we are counting on to push back against uh, the repression and those who are already under severe crackdown, increasingly isolated from their peers in the region and beyond. Uh, with hopeful signs that there, there might be new openings for diplomatic engagement in Iran, it's crucially important to plan for addressing the serious human rights situation in Iran. This doesn't mean that the human rights should be a precondition to engagement, but an integral part of it. Um, Europe should lead on ensuring coordinated multilateral effort on pressuring Iran for accountability as well as um, as well as reform on some of the most harmful practices in the country at the UN and at the member state level, while at the same time engaging with Iranian authorities broadly on human rights issues. Ensuring um, establishment of a robust dialogue with Iranian officials that addresses issues of um, concern as well as um, places that reform could take place in near future is very important. Europe should also do more um, to break the isolation of the Iranian civil society um, and um, come up with alternative for um, barriers of their participation. Um, messaging a coherent human, uh, human rights policy is just as important as the actions that need to be taken. Um, I think we need to, collectively, we need to move beyond the conversation as either or with regards to the question of engagement and human rights and, um, and talk about how to engage with Iran to ensure human rights standards are the center of these engagement. 
Um, for example, in, instead of talking about would um, a trade with Iran benefit human rights or harm human rights, we should all move, on, uh, move to come up with the message of how the trade with Iran should happen to ensure human rights obligations of companies as well as states that are engaging in these trades are compatible with, with business and human rights standards. Um, in, in short, I think um, I, we have seen some, hopefully there will be some movement, but it's crucially important uh, for Europe and European Parliament to um, adopt and communicate um, a policy that is centered around human rights and takes into account all human rights of Iranians, which includes civil and political rights, as well as economic, social, cultural rights. Uh, with this, I would like to stop here and I will be very happy to participate in the Q&A part of the panel as well. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. And thank you as well for what are some very practical and direct actions that can be taken on the part of um, member states and also on the part of European Union institutions, which I hope we'll have a chance to discuss more. And indeed, our colleagues from European Union institutions may have some responses to when we move to the Q&A. Um, I just wanted to note that with Farzana speaking there, I know that some of you may have had some challenges in the interpretation. Um, interpretation in Zoom is only available if you've downloaded the app. So if you join from your phone, perhaps it wouldn't be. But if you'll note in the chat, we have summarized some of it there. So you can have a look there and scan through there to follow, to follow her important input. Um, we now have the opportunity to hear from the German Human Rights Ambassador, Dr. Barbara Koffler. Um, she's the German Federal Government Commissioner for Human Rights and Humanitarian Aid since, since 2016, and her mandate includes advising the Federal Government on Germans, Germany's human rights and humanitarian aid. Um, and she also heads the German delegation at the high level segment of the UN Human Rights um, Council in Geneva. Um, and has been a member of the Bundestag since 2004. So you're very welcome. Um, it's very good to have you here and I will now hand over. Thank you, um, Ms. Koffler, Dr. Koffler. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for your invitation and um, that I'm able to participate in that very interesting round. Uh, well, really thanks to the two colleagues from the European Parliament who were organizing uh, along with frontline defense of this event. I think it is very important to debate about the human rights situation in general uh, in Iran, but especially also, of course, the situation on women human rights defenders. And personally, I want to say it's a great honor to speak on a panel with such brave women human rights uh, defenders, which we heard already. So uh, it's, it's really um, very, very welcome uh, all the information and all the part of uh, the debates you're sharing with us. And I have to say, I'm full of admiration for your work and your courage in your uh, engagement. Um, yeah, you already described, uh, I think I don't have to repeat that, the situation of women in Iran and that they have significantly fewer rights than men. You described it in the cases of family law, marriage, in the court, even in uh, their free time. There is legal oppression and we have to speak out uh, the facts, I think. And that's a part of this uh, discussion today. And I think that's very important. Um, yes, and uh, what they are fighting for, we heard that already. It's a modern way of life, it's democracy, it's civil rights, it's things which seem to be very normal to us in Europe, but which are obviously not the case in other places of the world. When I read a few days ago, yeah, whereas they are free and respected in Iran, it must seem very, very odd in the years of, of uh, women in Iran, and it seems like mocking on the lack of freedom of women there. I just read from the World Economic uh, Forum the, the, the ranking of Iran, if it's coming to a global, the global gender gap, and out of uh, 153 countries, Iran is on place 148. I think that says a lot already about the situation in Iran, for, especially for women. So, um, of course, in my work, parties are also to support as much as possible. Unfortunately, statements is one of the um, only or sometimes the only possibility I can support um, human rights defenders. And of course, I want to underline 
um, whenever it is possible for me, I, I support human rights defenders, women human rights defenders, especially from Iran. Just recently, um, not only me, but it was uh, civil society and a lot of colleagues, uh, we were trying to raise the situation and the situation of uh, Nasrin Sotodeh, she was mentioned a few times already today. And we've seen uh, that she was in, in terrible health conditions in prison. And uh, we continuously rise this situation, not only of Nasrin Sotodeh, but of her in that situation in prison, especially. And I learned from her when she was publishing an open letter um, a few days, a few weeks ago, or this week ago, uh, where she was denouncing, for example, the hanging of a woman in Kachak. And uh, to read that and see that the woman who was hanged there was already dead because she had a heart attack before. That is uh, learning something like that from um, somebody like Nasrin Sotudi, she facing or is in prison um, all the time and still fighting for the rights of other human rights defenders and female human rights defenders and pointing out the terrible situation a lot of people are facing. Um, it's sometimes heartbreaking, I want to say. Um, I'm proud that we um, were able to give the Franco-German Prize for Human Rights in 2019 to Nasrin Sotodeh. I think that was very important, but we of course know it's not only one name and one personality. We heard today already from uh, two really important human rights defenders like Nargis Mohamed Mahdi, for example, um, and of course, we know the situation and we, we won't forget the situation of others imprisoned and harassed and in sexually assaulted and uh, suffering, basically the, the depriving of their basic human rights. So I just want to name a few of them because I think uh, it's worth uh, to, to name them as, as often as possible. So I'm thinking of Sabakot Afsari, Moigan Kish. Keshavar, Yasaman Ayani, Momini Arabashi, Athena Dayemi, Koyruk Ebrahimi Irai, and many others. So there are so many women uh, who are fighting for basic human rights and uh, rights and who are deprived of their human rights that the international community has to act. Um, and I was asked to talk a little bit about the activities we can. Uh, do and we can can give to support women's rights in Iran. In Iran, it was mentioned by I think a colleague from the European Parliament already um, that uh, the situation will only change if the situation of the women is changing. So for me, it's very important to underline that uh, we have to support human rights defenders in general, but there is a special need for supporting women human rights defenders and they face more challenges or different challenges in a lot of cases uh, than their male colleagues. And I think we have to address that also. We recently, recently launched in Germany a new initiative supporting human rights defenders. It's named after um, a German uh, politician who was uh, also living through dictatorship in uh, the Nazi regime and was fighting for, for women's rights and human rights in that case. It's the so-called Elisabeth Selbert Initiative. And it's a new initiative and it should be especially there to support human rights defenders on the ground if it's possible, but also with uh, support to take them out of uh, their area of risk, their country uh, for at least a few months to give them uh, a relief and to give them the opportunity to organize their work again from abroad. So uh, it's a new initiative and it's of course also free to uh, for Iranian human rights defenders and I always underline for me it's very important especially also open for, for women because I think there is a special need on that. Um, recently, just recently in September last year, um, Germany, uh, the federal government issued a statement supported by 47 nations in the U UN Human Rights Council criticizing Iran for its human rights record. Um, and in this statement, 47 governments con, uh, condemned the unwavering, uh, commanded the unwavering courage of human rights defenders in Iran 
and I underline again, including women human rights defenders who really continue to suffer intimidation, prosecution, ill treatment. Um, they called on Iran to immediately release all of those who are arbitrarily detained as well as political prisoners and prisoners of conscience such as Nasrin Sotudi, or in the case, uh, now she is not in prison, but uh, in the case uh, she still was, Nagis Mohammadi. Uh, on many other occasions, my government, uh, also in coordination, I have to really to underline with partners from other European Union countries, um, has started, uh, has stated its position towards the Iran government and pointed out the obligations and duties under the international convenient on civil and political rights to which Iran is a signatory. So sometimes you also have to point out and, 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 and talk about what uh, uh, Iran was signing and uh, what they were joining in an international framework. Um, furthermore, um, the member states of the European Union have established a sanction regime that focuses especially uh, explicitly on human rights violations. And the intention is to send a clear message to perpetrators worldwide. Human rights must be respected and protected. And then the EU stands ready to react to serious human rights violation. You have to take those uh, mechanisms in place now. I think that is very important. Well, the United uh, Nations are equal, equally engaged uh, to defend the rights of female human rights defenders in Iran. Uh, in November, 2020, 38 nations, including Germany, co-sponsored a resolution on human rights in Iran. And this resolution explicitly calls on the, uh, upon the Islamic Republic of Iran to release human, uh, women human rights defenders in prison for exercising their rights. We heard that from uh, the colleagues from Iran already today. In prison for exercising their rights, including the rights to freedom of association and peaceful assembly and the right to freedom of expression of opin and opinion. Um, the re resolution urges the Iran government to take appropriate, robust and practical steps to protect women rights defenders and guarantee their full enjoyment of all their human rights. So that's of course on the international level in the, in the debate, in the international debate, the statements we could, uh, where we could make clear where we are all standing. Of course, we can try and we do that so uh, with direct actions through our embassies on the ground uh, to have continuously contact with civil society to support them on the ground where it is possible and especially support um, women human rights defenders. I know from my embassy in Tehran uh, that they are doing so and I, I'm sure and I know that other countries, European countries and like-minded countries are doing the same. Uh, what I think is quite interesting is the point, and um, see you in the pictures, I mean, it's coming to an end, uh, but uh, just a, a point I want to react on what Tara was mentioning on business and human rights, just that point I think is very important. We're trying to come up with a law in the supply chain and this, uh, um, business and human rights um, uh, due diligence um, regulations in Germany now, but it's on the European level also on the way. And I think we should use those tools also for really defending human rights defenders, supporting them and doing so also, uh, especially on, on the case of Iran. So I'm stopping there. Thank you for having me. And of course, thank you for everybody who is participating in that very interesting discussion. Thank you, Dr. Koffler. And thank you also for, for naming the women human rights defenders. I think that's a really important part that of course, there are defenders we have here today. There are those that are, those that are well known to us and the names that are known to us, but the many, many others that aren't. And, and there are so many women behind this that, that it's important for us to recognize that. And I think also um, your own input there just shows us this, this new, that your role of course is part of one of the new and more recent development by nation states to establish human rights ambassadors and, and your input there, the expertise and the resources that you bring to it um, really affirms this is another part of our mechanisms and our armor for engaging in, in these kinds of conversations, policy dialogues and actions. So thank you. Um, 
We do have one more, one more input before we move to the Q&A. So um, I'm also very glad to welcome um, Mr. Florian Mita from the EAS. So he's the deputy head of the EAS Iran Task Force um, and also supports the high representative in his role. Um, so and previously he's held different permissions with it, different different roles within EU institutions in that um, and the Romanian Ministry for Foreign Affairs. So um, Mr. Nita, I really welcome you to turn on your camera and um, we'd appreciate hearing from you also. Thank you so much, uh, and really thank you for having me. And uh, I've been paying attention to uh, all the interventions so far, and uh, I really feel uh, humbled. And uh, just want to thank you, uh, uh, from my defenders, uh, for organizing this or for facilitating the, this event. And not least uh, to uh, MAPs, uh, Frau Ernst and uh, Mr. Utasun. Uh, and uh, really want to pay tribute uh, to, to them for taking this, uh, this event forward and inviting us to attend, but not least to the parliament as such, for uh, the strong commitment uh, to address human rights issues in particular in Iran. And uh, they know very well, and you know very well that there is a strong commitment by uh, High Representative Borrell to work closely uh, with the European Parliament uh, and human rights issues in Iran really make uh, no exception. Um, let me also uh, really commend uh, the work of the human rights defenders, uh, uh, both women and men, but in particular those present with us today, but also uh, those women that are, uh, um, are in Iran uh, and all over the world that are uh, making their voice heard, uh, who so often really take so many risks and, uh, and suffer in order to advocate and practice uh, core values that for us here in EU are rather self-understood. Um, as part of the bilateral engagement with Iran, uh, the EU continues to really urge the Iranian authorities uh, to guarantee the full range of uh, fundamental rights for their citizens and irrespective of religion, belief, uh, or any other status. And uh, you mentioned before, and just let me uh, re-emphasize, I mean, women in Iran are really among the uh, most educated maybe in the Middle East. Uh, and they continue to really face uh, so many challenges and severe violation to their rights uh, in law, but also in, in, in practice. Um, and uh, gender-based discrimination persists, uh, notably with regard to marriage, divorce, child custody, freedom of movement, employment, and access uh, to political functions. Um, some recent steps have been taken. Uh, we are aware of that there was gender equality, uh, like the national law amendment uh, providing uh, for Iranian women married to non-Iranian men the right to apply for Iranian nationality for their children age under 18. But certainly these are small steps and more needs to be done. Um, but ongoing um, actions against uh, women uh, human rights defenders in Iran, uh, as was mentioned before, including harassment, arbitrary detention is really a matter of deep concern uh, for us. And targeting of relatives, for example, to coerce women human rights defender into stopping their activism is really uh, very concerning as well. Um, just want to, uh, to say that as part of a broader dialogue with the Iranian authorities, I mean, we and the EU raises uh, the concerns over the situation of hum women human rights defenders systematically. Um, and in particular, we urge the Iranian government to release the human rights defender, but also in particular women human rights defenders, uh, arbitrarily detained to uphold the due process rights, to ensure that applicable domestic international law is respected, as was also mentioned before by some speakers, uh, including Iran's commitments under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and not least International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Um, the COVID situation was also mentioned uh, before, and indeed, uh, we still see uh, roughly 8,000 new daily infections. Uh, and uh, in this context, we, as you regularly call for the permanent, uh, for the, the temporary release at least, uh, of uh, women human rights defenders, along with as many prisoners as possible, um, in order to, uh, for uh, initial stage to uh, safeguard their life. Um, do you also insist and this is very important, uh, both privately and publicly, uh, there must be accountability for abuses where and when they occur. Uh, and in this context, um, we just want to recall that you has been supporting the annual um, 
UN General Assembly a resolution on the human rights situation in Iran. And uh, really, EU remains a strong supporter to the UN Special Rapporteur on the human rights in Iran. Uh, let me uh, say a few words that our approach to human rights, uh, uh, in particular in relation to Iran, is an uh, integral part of the EU policy vis-à-vis -vis Iran. And uh, as you know, uh, as part of the GCPOA, uh, this open up uh, a front for political dialogue bilaterally and as, uh, as, uh, uh, as a basis having a, a joint statement from 16 April 2016 on EU-Iran relations. Um, and we also had adopted uh, new council conclusions last year um, in 2019. And uh, there, I think our approach to uh, the policy towards Iran is very clear, and we we say that is is balanced and co is a comprehensive approach, and uh, based on dialogue, uh, but at the same time critical when there are divergences and cooperative when there is mutual interest. I mean, it might sound uh, very diplomatically put, but in reality, uh, I think this gives you a, a very uh, clear sense of where we are, and we don't shy from from uh, from really uh, making a the point and, uh, and defending values that are so important to us. And uh, last but not least, I mean, we was also mentioned before, uh, as part of his policy uh, and commitments uh, to address all issues of concern, uh, the EU also has a range of autonomous restrictive measures in place. And uh, in particular, uh, when it comes to, uh, to a serious human rights violation in Iran, and uh, these are regularly viewed uh, in light of the, the development in the country. Um, it, as was mentioned uh, also uh, <coughs> before um, about death penalty and uh, execution also by Nardis. So let me say uh, that we, uh, uh, we really, this is a source of major concern for us. When we see all the execution of juvenile offenders of protesters and dissidents uh, with more than 200 individuals executed in 2020 alone, um, this is really extremely high rate for us and is one of the highest in the world. So in, in this context, our position is very, very clear and we strongly condemn the use of death penalty under any circumstances. And uh, also through public statements and repeated calls, um, we, we, we call on Iran really to, to pursue a consistent policy to, towards abolition of capital punishment. Um, we continue monitoring and reacting uh, at all levels as appropriate, as I just mentioned, bilaterally, but also in, in various fora, uh, to all developments related to respect to fundamental human rights and in particular hum women human rights defenders. And um, we have a coordinated approach with the, the new member states present locally, um, in particular also with the, the country that is holding uh, the rotating presidency of the council, which is now Portugal. Uh, in particular, as you know, that EU is not present locally with a delegation in Iran. So uh, I would uh, rather stop here and give a bit of space for Q&A and uh, looking very much forward. And thank you so much for, for having me once again. Thank you very much, Mr. Nita. Um, and I'd like to invite all of our panelists maybe to turn on your cameras at the moment because we're going to move to a section now where we'll try and have um, a Q&A. And um, I see we have a couple of questions that's come in already. Um, and I might kick off with one or two myself and then we'll try and address um, as many as we can. Okay, so maybe let's see. So if everyone can turn on the cameras again, we'll give, we'll give everyone um, our participants a minute or two, great. Ms. Koffler, maybe we'll kick off Dr. Koffler as I see you there. I might take my privilege and have a question in relation to the role of um, EU human rights ambassadors. And I, you certainly, I felt, had a really strong focus on individual cases. And I'm just wondering what potential do you see for EU human rights ambassadors to really prioritize and to bring forward individual cases and sort of show the stories, the names, the people behind it. And then perhaps the second part of that is just how is that role collaborating with the many other mechanisms that are already in place with your colleagues in the MEPs, the EAS, the special rapporteurs within the UN and carving out that space for that? Well, thank you for that question, because uh, it's showing that this group, which is actually an informal group of uh, human rights ambassadors from various European Union countries, 
but also uh, in many cases joined by uh, the British uh, colleague. Um, we would call ourselves a, a kind of like-minded group who are trying really to make an impact on the human rights situation and also not only talk about individual cases, but also on thematic topics. Um, we will come up with statements on uh, gender equality, for example, and other issues. But um, we really want to make a, a difference also and, and try to have a bigger impact on individual cases because we strongly believe it's uh, more heard and the reactions we got actually uh, underlining that we are more heard in the individual cases if we speak out uh, as Europeans, as uh, human rights ambassadors from various countries, and not only as a single national human rights ambassador. So we try to create uh, additional um, mm. value. Um, we did that the last time, I think, which was quite obvious heard was the case of Osman Kavala in Turkey. We did that also with um, uh, the arrested uh, human rights defenders in Egypt uh, at the end of last year. So we're trying to focus on that also, but we have to do, of course, then a follow up. It's not an institution, so we are not in conference to other European institutions and we don't see ourselves as a conference and we don't want that. We're trying to be as coherent as possible with uh, European Union and uh, what is coming from, from there, but we have a mandate from our own government and we try to um, find a, a common language around the European capitals on individual cases in trying to protect uh, those cases. Um, we are also in contact with uh, Eamon Gilmer from the European Union to discuss uh, standards and European uh, action plans and standards on human rights. So we want to be an additional value and push for human rights and not something in concurrence or something we made up or whatever. It's uh, uh, trying to unify our, our work. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Koffler. Um, and Ms. Janita, I see you nodding there when she spoke about complementarity and engaging. I think I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that, about you know, how uh, um, your own, the, the EAS, might engage or, or with, with these roles. And also, I see there's another couple of questions there. There's one question in relation to the JCPOA. Is it enough? Um, is it enough? With the, is this agreement enough? Um, and should human rights become more primacy to these agreements, um, a prime condition of it? And a second question there, you might have some thoughts on around the emergency visa program for human rights defenders. It'd be good to hear your thoughts on this. And then thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I was nodding indeed because uh, you really need a, a joint up approach between uh, the parliament, uh, the member states, uh, EU institutions uh, and, and NGOs really to, to speak with one voice. And I think this is really essential in, in really uh, uh, having an impact. And uh, what we have seen recently uh, over the last years is indeed more and more uh, this joint up approach and I think is, is the way ahead. Um, now, uh, when it comes to, uh, to GCPOA, I, I don't want to, uh, to discuss on, on that uh, here because I think that the topic and focus is different. Uh, only to say that from our point of view, uh, GCPOA open uh, uh, an important channel of, of dialogue with, with the Iranian authorities uh, to address different issues, including the human rights uh, situation. Uh, and I um, haven't mentioned before, but we have a regular high level dialogue with, uh, with Iran, EU Iran. And in that context, uh, uh, Ms. Koffler mentioned um, a special representative, um, uh, Gilmore, on human rights. He is the one chairing a, a dedicated uh, human rights dialogue with Iran. And we really don't shy from really uh, uh, taking this, this discussion very seriously with the Iranian authorities. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and this is only possible by, uh, by the mere fact that we have GCPOA in place. So I would like to keep uh, away uh, what's, uh, what's happening now and is a rather intense period uh, uh, with high representative as coordinator of GCPOA uh, Joint Commission and trying to really be in touch with everyone, um, uh, all the participants uh, in order to really find a way forward uh, diplomatically to bring uh, the GCPOA back on track and not least to facilitate US return to the deal as such. 
but and I think that uh, this uh, this focus would also reinforce the other separate channel, which is, as I said, trying to address bilaterally with Iran uh, issues of serious concern, including uh, the human rights. Uh, now, in terms of how we support, and we we, we plan to do so, uh, uh, I think the most important is uh, really. Uh, taking very clear and, and firm and resolute uh, 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 position publicly. And we have not shied and high representative has not been shy in, in taking a very clear position in that regard. Um, of course, now we're in the, in the process of, uh, of discussing and agreeing uh, the programming for European Commission for the next seven years, so-called Indici. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, support for democracy and human rights defenders is part of that. So certainly, I mean, this will not uh, will be part of our of our uh, uh, focus and our uh, our concern, and uh, can rest assured that uh, we'll try to do everything possible to 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 really use everything in our disposal to to try to help uh, all the, the the women rights human rights defender, but also human rights defender in general in Iran uh, as much as possible. Thank you, Mr. Nita. Um, maybe then I would like to look to Nargis and Farzana to hear from you further. So there was a question here, which is, what are the ways in which the EU and human rights ambassadors can contribute to amplifying the voices of human rights defenders? So what do you think that EU, EU institutions and also national institutions can do to really amplify the voice, your voices and the voices of other women human rights defenders? Maybe Farzana, would you like to start there? Are you okay with that? And we do have translation if you wish to speak in Farsi or in English. If it's Farsi, we have translation and encourage everyone to just hit English to get that. So please. I believe that the most important thing that international and human rights organizations can do is to amplify the voices of the Iranian women through the media and maybe making documents and uh, annual report. They could compile annual report about the events taking place in Iran and also the activities and the problems faced by women in various spheres and uh, problems that they deal with in their everyday life if they could document these events and also uh, propagate them through whatever means at their disposal, this would actually raise awareness throughout the world about the plight of Iranian women and the pressures they're under and the heavy sentences that are meted out against women when their most basic rights has been violated. They such as uh, little things like singing, sports, uh, for which they are uh, prosecuted, maybe for other women around the world, this would be very strange that such uh, things are happening in Iran. And I think, again, I emphasize the um, importance of networking, networking with Iranian women in whatever way, uh, um, what whatever means possible, uh, bearing in mind their security concerns of these women. And that way they can hear about uh, experiences of these women firsthand um, and uh, the problems that they face on a day-to-day -day basis. And that way they would hopefully be able to amplify these women. Sports. Thank you. Thank you for Zara. And Nargis, the same question around the voice. And also, I know there was a comment earlier around challenging that Persian centered approach and having a more human approach, human rights approach. And I think for me, that spoke to non discrimination within the human rights movement within Iran. And I wondered if that was something you might also like to speak about. And Nargis, you might need to take yourself off mute there. 
This is always one of our challenges when we're on yes. these calls. Great. Um, the Islamic Republic of Iran's regime is a theocracy and it is also a patriarchal rule. Therefore, please understand how difficult it is for us women to do anything in Iran. Of course, that doesn't mean that we're not doing anything. Iranian women's society are extremely active and they're striving very hard and to achieve their rights they are paying a heavy price but the truth of the matter is that there are tools that we need to have in order to achieve our goals and we lack these tools. For instance, we don't have an independent, uh, any independent women's media in Iran. We don't have any independent voices of women in Iran. We do not have any powerful civil women's movements in Iran. برای رسیدن به اهداف ما ما ابزارهایی نیاز داریم که انتظار مجامع بین المللی حقوق بشری very much hope that international european parliament european union برای دستیابی ما به این ابزار نیاز کمک بکنند attain these tools in order to achieve our goals ما در ایران تقلاگر زن برای رسیدن به اهداف زنانه داریم ولی ابزارش رو نداریم. We do have the women who want to work hard, they want to strive hard but they lack these tools. من سوالم اینه که اگر اتحادیه اروپا با کشور جمهوری اسلامی ایران داره در رابطه با معاهدات بین المللی مذاکره میکنه. Negotiating with the Iranian government on various international accords آیا میتونه از کشور جمهوری اسلامی ایران سوال بکنه که چرا نهادهای زنان همه سرکوب شدن؟ آیا منافع جامعه ایران مورد نظر اتحادیه اروپا هست؟ من در ملاقاتی که با خانم اشتون هم داشتم بهشون گفتم شما به همون نسبت Baroness Catherine Ashton, when I had a brief meeting with her when she was in Iran, and I said, if only you could pay the same attention that you're paying to the Iranian foreign ministry and to the government of the Islamic Republic by um, conducting negotiations with them, if you could attach the same importance to باید به جامعه ایران جامعه مدنی ایران اهمیت بدیم اتحادیه اروپا و پارلمان اروپا اگر با کشور ایران در در مورد مسائل بسیار مهم جامعه مدنی باید با فعالان جامعه مدنی مذاکره کنند when it comes to affairs related to civil society and their activities. در واقع میخوام بگم قرب باید به جامعه مدنی را احترام بذاره. I want to say that the West must respect Iranian civil society. و این احترام رو باید به نظام جمهوری اسلامی را یاداوری بکنه تا نظام جمهوری اسلامی را بدونه. And they must remind the Islamic Republic of Iran's government how important it is to respect the civil society. تأمین منافع اقتصادی بدون منافع جامعه مدنی Just از نظر من providing مهمده. economic interests without paying any attention to Iranian societies and the civil society's interests in my opinion is a null and void Thank you Nargis um, Tara um, before I invite back in our MEPs for some closing comments and to share their in the conversation and dialogue. Um, one of the things we've tried there are some of the tools. Um, and of course, we have the new EU human rights sanction regime being introduced. Um, there are some who've said that perhaps there is already a sanctions regime in place when you have 82 Iranian individuals who are already facing sanctions and some that say maybe that's sufficient. And I'm just wondering around your thoughts or if you want to share anything or indeed on other tools within the EU 
around um, what, what your thoughts on what's the most appropriate, what's the most relevant, what's going to be the most useful? Mm -hmm. um, I think um, individual designation, when implemented as part of a broader human rights policy, the comprehensive human rights policy, and uh, with a view to end the abuse um, and push towards accountability and changing the, the, the behavior, of the, the, abu the abusive behavior can, can be a very important tool um, because they in, the intention is to minimize the harm on um, those who are not responsible for the violation, targets those who are responsible, and then create incentives for reform. But there are two caveats that I think is important when we're talking about sanction regimes in general and Iran. Most importantly, colloquially, we all call them sanctions um, because they're, they're a form of sanction. Um, but uh, I think we need to do more in um, terms of differentiating what we mean by sanction uh, when we're talking about individual designation of human rights violators versus broad sectoral sanctions that often have nothing to do with human rights. They've never been about human rights. They're lifting imposition. Uh, it's not going to be conditioned on human rights. And in fact, um, they, har they, they contribute to harm in, in many different ways. So I think um, generally in terms of clarifying that and communicating that to, um, to the Iranian community, to the press, to all of that. So we, we know what exactly we're talking about. And secondly, which I think is important and I take the liberty on framing it because we are an organization that work on more than 90 countries around the world. And, and it's the importance of consistency and, stand and transparency and standards. Um, Otherwise, we risk sanctions um, diminishing their individual designation, diminishing their, um, their um, legitimacy and being seen as a political tool. Um, and so one thing we have been advocating um, more, more vocally over the, past, um, over the past year and after the um, and after the election in the United States is adopting a regional approach to human rights issues, a Middle East regional approach to human rights issues. Um, many of the problems we're seeing um, in the region have common roots and problems. And in order to transform these societies to right respecting ones, we need consistency and we need principled approach. Um, and I think it's not just in terms of um, bringing how bad is them, it's not something that human rights organizations do, but, but being able to point out um, how approaches to different violators of human rights has been consistent will empower our ability and our tools um, to both hold violators accountable and create incentives for reform. Thank you, Tara. I think we're coming to our conclusions. I'd like to invite our MEPs, MEP Ortizan and MEP Ernst to rejoin us. Um, and I know they will have some thoughts and comments to share in conclusion. And um, I note there were two questions specific to MEPs. There was a very open question there around how can civil society support um, the parliament, MEPs and their work for human rights defenders, a general question. And then a second question there for yourself and MEP Ernst as chair of the parliamentary delegation for relationships with Iran. How does that dialogue, how does the EU dialogue work? What's the potential in that? And there were quite a few aspects to that, but maybe you could just touch on it briefly there. Okay, well, thank you so much. It uh, has been extremely interesting to hear all of your experiences. And uh, also, and this is going to be my first, my first point, um, at the EU level, uh, we are uh, used to hear a lot of talk uh, uh, when it comes to the GCPOA um, in relation to uh, high officials in the country, but we, are, we, we don't hear much voices from civil society explaining what's going on on the ground. This is, I mean, uh, the, the, the general public in Europe knows very little about uh, life of ordinary citizens in Iran, of women and of civil society. And I think that what we did today was important um, you know, for us to be able to listen to you, uh, but I think we should improve that. Um, uh, well, of course, the parliament is now working in very difficult circumstances. We are not, uh, but normally we are uh, a very open institutions where we uh, host a lot of people for open discussions. Now it's more difficult like for everybody else. But I can absolutely tell you that Cornelia and I are absolutely committed uh, that this component of uh, a civil society in our relations with Iran is more and more strengthened. And actually we are thinking about leading an initiative 
permanent dialogue with civil society between Iran and Europe, which I think is extremely, extremely relevant. This is this is the first thing that I think we need to focus on, huh? because now we will we will very quickly re-enter into the GCPOA talks that will make the headlines, but we, we, we can't forget uh, uh, that your voices need to be counted. Now, secondly, um, I fully agree with uh, something that Tara said in her first intervention. I mean, it's not anymore about if uh, we need to engage with Iran or not, it's uh, how we do it and in which way we, we do it in order to put human rights at the forefront. And I think that um, until now, this is at least my, my, my opinion, but I think this is shared with the majority of you. The maximum pressure policy uh, has been a complete failure. I mean, it has only worsened your conditions in the country. Uh, and 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 it has weakened our leverage towards the towards uh, the Iranian government as well in terms of human rights. This for me is 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 it's a very clear lesson. But hopefully we are entering a new a new phase, where I think that the EU um, has different tools uh, uh, in this new um, in this new uh, period, and particularly as coordinator of the GCPOA process uh, to put uh, human rights at the forefront. So I'm sure, and Mr. Nida was here today with us, that we will work together in order to uh, uh, for this to happen, and that uh, in this new period that we will now be engaging with the country that the human rights are put at the at, at, at the forefront. And finally, just to mention that. Um, um, well, the last uh, uh, resolution on Iran uh, that the parliament adopted uh, is already a bit old. Uh, we are already considering with Cornelia, maybe she can say a word about that, about the need maybe to push for a, for a, for a new text just to, uh, do, uh, to be a bit ahead of the, the, the political talks that will develop in the coming months. Um, and I think that, uh, well, this is going to be also an opportunity to raise all the issues that you have been mentioning uh, in, um, in the institution. So ju just be aware that we will be also engaged if this happens and if we are going to adopt a new text, we will be engaged in, um, in, um, in, uh, in that. And maybe the last, my last point again, maybe, and I will, I will, um, I will just uh, let the Cornel conclude uh well you, you you are going to have a very important electoral process in the coming months uh, and i think that we need to be aware that uh, that this process happens with uh, all the, the best conditions possible we know it's difficult eh? but that, that, that your voices are heard and that you are able to make your voice here in that process with all the difficulties we know and uh, you, you don't have to tell you don't have to tell us that because i think we're fully aware but thank you again uh, very much to frontline defender as well for organizing this and uh, good luck you can count on us uh, to support your struggle and we'll be there for you anytime you need us. Thank you so much. Yeah, I can only add uh, and I can only underline uh, what uh, Ernest said. Um, we are with uh, our heart <laughs> in all this fight. And I think uh, if I look at the Islamic Republic, uh, I can only say the most important basis of this Islamic uh, Republic is a Sharia and is a discrimination of uh, a lot of people because of a lot of reasons. And uh, this, this uh, is often the question um, I ask me, how reformable is a, is a system? And I think it isn't reformable. This is a problem. And, and we have uh, to look, what can we do in, 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 in this situation? And this is very specific. It's not only a question of a uh, uh, closed society. Okay, um, yeah, I think we can do a lot uh, in the European Parliament and we try to do a lot. Uh, first, I think, okay, we have the Iran delegation, this is a not so big uh, delegation of uh, members of different groups. We know we can uh, discuss uh, issues, uh, human rights issues in Iran, uh, we can uh, discuss uh, environmental uh, questions and uh, many other things. Um, this is very important to have um, an exchange um, in the European Parliament about all these questions and then we can use it uh, uh, to push uh, resolutions and I think yes, uh, we need a new and updated resolution and discussion uh, on the human rights questions, especially uh, on uh, the women issues uh, in the European Parliament. I would like to support it. The second point is what we need is a platform. I think a platform on uh, human rights activists, um, not only activists, uh, try to, to uh, produce, uh, to create a platform where we speak, uh, where we invite uh, 
parliamentarians from different um, uh, different levels, uh, national level, but uh, European level, um, and also activists um, from different um, fields. Uh, I think we need this platform um, more or less outside of the parliament, but uh, connected with the parliament. Um, and uh, the idea of uh, Ernesto, I think uh, this is a good idea. and. Uh, I'm hopeful that we can come to such a platform. And the next one is uh, JCPOA. Okay, yes, it's true. We discuss very often uh, the JCPOA and uh, you know the European Parliament uh, has the opinion and uh, I'm happy, Mr. Borrell too, uh, that we need this JCPOA because we don't want that uh, Iran become uh, a nuclear power in this region. It's, it would be horrible, really. And I think that's why, yes, we need the JCPOA and we need it as a door opener to discuss uh, other issues. It's the only possibility in this moment. But it's true, yes, uh, JCPOA is not enough. And no one uh, in the European uh, Parliament uh, says uh, it is enough. Why enough? It's not enough, and uh, but we have a chance. We have a little bit more chance to discuss uh, a lot of um, uh, questions um, related with, uh, with Iran, uh, to the Iran, um, and uh, that's why we should support it. What we have done is uh, discuss a lot of um, problems, human rights problems, in uh, with together with other uh, committees. Uh, maybe um, the DRA uh, committee, uh, we had uh, had uh, some um, some meetings uh, with, uh, uh, with the DRA committee, and I think uh, we should use all the possibilities of, of the parliament for uh, this topic. And my last point is um, sanctions. Uh, okay, if you look at uh, Iranian, I, I think no other country in the world uh, <laughs> is affected with so much um, uh, uh, sanctions uh, like Iran. Okay, some sanctions more. It's nice, yes, uh, or not nice. However, we should look, uh, if we speak about uh, sanctions, what is sensible and uh, what, what can we arrive it doesn't mean to be uh, against sanctions. No, 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 no. But we have to look very careful. What does it mean uh, for the inhabitants in Iran? That's why I'm skeptical that we can change the life uh, in Iran uh, by more sanctions. Um, but the only possibility what we have is to raise the topics, to discuss the issues, to, to uh, uh, try to come to positions in the European Parliament uh, and in the EU, and then we can be very strong. So, and one of my goals is that nothing so today uh, will be free. <laughs> Let's fight for that. <laughs> and also for other activists um, together, this is for me very important and um, thanks for all. Uh, contributions today and additions, recommendations, criticism, all is necessary and uh, we are open for all that. Thanks. Thank you, Amy Perenst. So one of my jobs as well as chairing was to try and see that we finished on time, which I've nearly done, just a couple of minutes over. So um, um, what really falls to me now is um, thank yous. Um, very much thank you to our MEP co-hosts. Um, thank you to all our participants, or our, those who joined us and shared thoughts and opinions, and to Mariam, our translator also. Um, I think we had some, some analysis, some critique, some chal many challenges, but also ideas and opportunities that we were shared as well. But I think most finally, the thanks falls to Farzana and to Nargis. Um, we've heard all of everyone here today talking about admiration, expressing our appreciation for the work that you do and the courage and the determination that we show. 
but also we're all very clear that those words needs to be followed up with action, with action and with protection and support for you as well. And that's something we all strongly believe in here as well. So um, finally, just to express our solidarity, solidarity with you and particularly now our guests, of course, with the ongoing court case that we will be following and working with you to support you on. And many of the other, the women human rights defenders, the ones that we haven't named or can't name and all of those women human rights defenders in Iran indeed, and the work that they're doing. So thank you very much, everyone, for your time today, and we very much appreciate it, and we look forward to continued discussion and conversation and engagement with you all. Thank you very much. Take thank care. you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.